compute scales all the way to providing also a technology platform for creating your own ecosystems and SDKs and a real life example of an IDE built with Qt is presented next by Justin Howard from Qualcomm and uh, well let's let's hear it from Justin and let him tell what they're doing for embedded development with their IDEs right for Justin Howard, Qualcomm. We've had a lot to do with what you've been doing. Every 9.8 seconds, you're reaching for it, that thing we did. No, we're not the name you think of when you think of smartphones, but we are the smart behind every phone you can think of. So my marketing people tell me that nobody knows who Qualcomm actually is. Now. I think I'd disagree. That was uh, my colleague and I last month over at Berlin Airport. And um, not only is the airport plastered with Qualcomm advertisements, but the whole of Berlin is. And I reckon that pretty much everybody in this room knows what a Snapdragon is, or isn't holding a phone with a Qualcomm chipset in at the moment. But what people probably don't know is the breadth of things that Qualcomm does, uh, and in particular in terms of defining an industry and moving things forward. So let's give an orientation to that. So we'll start with the slide. Qualcomm is quite a large organization. There's about 30,000 people uh, in it at the moment, and potentially we will double in the next year if certain acquisitions go along. Um, we've uh, being the first in many, many things, we were a pioneer in mobile phone chipsets, um, and over the past 30 years, we've become the number one fabulous semiconductor company in the world. We're also the top 3G and 4G chipset manufacturer, and just this year, we will be shipping um, over 850,000 um, mobile phone chipsets around the world. But as time moves on, we kind of predict a slowdown. So while the last 30 years have been very much about phones, uh, we think that the next 30 years is going to be about connecting devices to the world. We colloquially call this the Internet of Things, but when we refer to things, we mean small devices that are doing very specific tasks all connected together. So in fact, we're already well down this road. And as Qualcomm, we've shipped over 1.5 billion devices. But if we combine those figures with our uh, Bluetooth-related chipset, um, figures, then we're talking about over 5 billion devices in the world already doing these very, very small, dedicated Internet of Things based tasks. But what are all these devices exactly? So at one end, we have all of those small, portable devices, the things like the smartwatches and the headsets and this kind of thing. But at the other end, we have a range of invisible technologies, uh, technologies that are barely noticed in terms of how well that they integrate. So a lot of my work is to do with Bluetooth chipsets. And so to this end, this is where things get interesting quite quickly. So here are some examples. We're developing all sorts of software to improve networks, audio, and products. We're gradually migrating to a world where all of those low-cost, load-powered devices used in the Internet of Things are getting more and more complex. So, We've been trying to create a development environment where we have to consider all of this, because ultimately, um, this is what we need to manage and maintain. But to understand this, let's look inside one of these devices. So here we have a typical Bluetooth uh, chipset using a wireless speaker. Its main purpose is just to play music. But what we have in reality is an entire computer system on a chip. It's a multi-core solution. We have seven main cores in here. Each of those is dedicated to a different task. So around the outside, we haul off all of the periphery and circuitry that we would need to support music. But we have a highly unique set of characteristics designed to tackle all sorts of things, from power management to performance, and fundamentally, so that we can limit the size of the silicon and therefore keep the price down. All of this adds to the complexity. So in order to develop an IDE, we needed to technically appraise all of these types of devices that we want to work with. 
along with all the typical tasks and goals that a software engineer has in creating IoT products, we have to couple with this considerations related to that hardware, that power, um, and all of that unusual universe that we're working with. So it, it's evolved through the needs of the products, and they're pushed to do a limited amount of things with that silicon. Consider it the perfect storm of trying to cram in as many capabilities as possible while being competitively priced. How do we go about that? So when designing an IDE, we need to consider all of these things uh, that you would associate with the typical design principles of software, simplify, give the users what they need, uh, provide an easy way for them to develop their products. So how did we go about this? Well, we looked at all the different IDEs that were out there, and we zeroed in on Qt Creator. Qt Creator turned out to be one of our best options. It was the most flexible platform. It gave us the best opportunities in terms of putting things together. But we did have these new requirements related to SDKs, development, debugging, and pushing things further within this embedded internet domain. So here's our IDE. It looks pretty much like you would see in terms of Qt Creator. Um, except under the hood, we've had to do things in completely different ways. We have completely new ways of managing SDKs and managing projects, and we have a radically new debugger inside orientated towards embedded development. So to give you an idea, we spend a lot of time in the embedded world um, pouring over source code while analyzing uh, disassembled code to work out optimizations, behavior, and performance, that kind of thing. These are the typical tasks as embedded software engineer that we want to do within a debugger. So I'll give you an example. So what we have here is we have um, source code on the left, and we have disassembled code on the right. And we have a blue marker indicating that the focus was in the disassembled code. Depending on the focus and how we step, things act differently. So if I press F10, we move down an instruction within the disassembled code. If I press F10 again, then we move down to the next instruction. At some point, we're going to get to the point where this source code side needs to move on. So if I step again, we'll then move down to the next instruction. The same is true as we go down. So we might be looking at the way that the optimized compiler dealt with the disassembled code, and we'll go step, and we'll go step, and then when we jump, we'll see it move. So we can track these yellow arrows on either side, depending on the context that we're looking with. I can flip it the other way. So if I, my focus is now in the source code, and I'm stepping on the source, then we'll see a similar thing occur with the yellow arrows on the disassembled code. So if I go step on the source code, will immediately jump uh, with the yellow arrow rather than it stepping through each individual instruction. If I step again, we'll immediately go down to the next thing. And so as we're looking at the way that those pieces of code are being put together and we start to optimize them, we get a very clear idea about how things fit together. It does, however, because as I said, it's complex, get a lot more weird. Let's take breakpoints. Now, breakpoints are a fun game at the best of times. They get really weird when you have to start dealing with the way that the hardware works and the way that the software integrates with that. So if we look at the first one up here, uh, what we've got is we've got a breakpoint tree. This is showing us what breakpoints we've set. Um, in the code, we use F9, just as normal, in order to add little red dots anywhere we want. Uh, if we add them on the disassembled side, that's fair enough. We get an address breakpoint. We'll get a little A signified in the source code of roughly where that is. That gives us a clue when we can't see one universe on the other side. Um, and then if we go down to the source side, we'll see that, oh, there we go. Um, if we go down to the source code side, if we set a, set a breakpoint on the source side, we'll see the equivalence within the disassembled code with these two little s's. But the relationship is complex. As you can see, when we set one breakpoint in source code, we've got multiple ones within the disassembled code. What's happening here is that for every line of source, we need to get address point breakpoints. Um, those breakpoints need to be set inside hardware. So we don't always know where the path of truth is. In here, we've got uh, multiple instructions on one line, and so that translates to multiple addresses. So this is why we get two little s's on one side in the disassemble code, because for each of these terms, we need to set a breakpoint. The problem with this is that as you get to these types of statements, as you get to things like for loops, you don't know where the point of truth is. You don't know where that first breakpoint needs to set. You might think, I'll take the first address within the list. That isn't necessarily the one you want. So we have to put together a system where users can mitigate their breakpoints and manage them such that they can do exactly what they want to do. It gets complicated because 
Um, inside our hardware, we might have one hardware breakpoint. We might have five hardware breakpoints, but what we haven't got is an infinite amount of hardware breakpoints. So in order to do very basic things that you would do in a high-level language where you set a breakpoint and you hit F5 and you hit it, we have to start guiding the user towards how to do this in a simple way when ultimately underneath we've got something quite complex. So one of the other things we have is multi-core debugging. Now, I showed early on in one of those slides that we had lots of cores. There's no rule that says those cores have to be the same. Imagine taking an Intel x86 and an ARM processor, combining them together into a single chip. What we're doing is um, we're choosing different cores and different roles in order to fit different things. But the problem we have now is that when we're dealing with our debugger, we have a lot of information. It's, uh, core management is a bit like taking threads and processes and combining them together. So we have the concept of a current core. We have a concept of a current thread. But we need to show that within a user interface. So within this example up here, um, what I've got is context. So um, all of our windows for things like variables and registers and other bits and pieces, all of these can be in a window, and it will track the current one. That's why it says current up here, and we see the current core, and we see what's in the toolbar. If we want to change the current core, all of our universe will change. Everything within that debugger will adapt to that new core. That includes the instruction sets of disassembled code. That includes all sorts of aspects. Alternatively, we might want to deal with multiple cores at the same time. So we can actually lock things down. So we can duplicate windows, duplicate register windows, and say, don't track them. Lock them to particular cores. But what we're fundamentally doing is we're trying to wire things together in a way that allows us to see that universe in a clear way to solve all of those kind of technical problems. So I think I've given you a little perspective in a very short period of time about what Qualcomm does. But I've also tried to show you uh, we've taken Qt Creator and adapted it to the growing world of embedded Internet of Things. It's clear that the embedded world has an awful lot of constraints related to it. At one level, we have a system on a chip, and at another level, we have dedicated hardware for a specific problem. And at another area, we have severely limited hardware because of cost pressures. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the tour. Feel free to contact me. And if you'd like any more insight into our technical world, just, just let us know. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.